Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us um, from across the world. We saw that we have some people uh, viewing from Brazil and Chile and other countries in Latin America and America, United States as well. So thank you for joining us for our first um, PRS Grand Rounds. Tonight we will be presenting Getting It Right with the Nasal Dorsum in Rhinoplasty. Our guest lecturer is uh, PRS and PRS Global Open Editor-in-Chief Rod J. Rorick. Um, if this goes well, then we will continue PRS Grand yeah. Rounds. <laughs> Sorry, he's right there. When this goes well, we will continue PRS Grand Rounds. We already have a couple people lined up. Alexis Hazen from New York will be delivering a lecture on transgender surgery. And Robert Murphy from Pennsylvania will be delivering a lecture on leadership and outcomes in plastic surgery. So feel free to ask questions throughout the lecture in the comments section below. Uh, Dr. Rourke will be attempting to answer as many as he can after the lecture. We'd like to thank our resident ambassadors, Jordan Fry, Shuja Shafkat, and Chad Purnell for coming up with this great idea to use Facebook Live to bring you lectures in the, forms, uh, in the form of hashtag PRS Grand Rounds. So thank you very much to Jordan, Chad, and Shuja. Without further ado, uh, I will present Rod Rorick for Getting It Right with the Nasal Dorsum and Rhinoplasty. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron. By the way, Aaron is our dynamic managing editor uh, for the, the Journal of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. So welcome, everybody. This is a very unique time. Uh, first time ever we're doing Facebook Live with PRS Grand Rounds. Um, and uh, picking one of my favorite topics, rhinoplasty. So we're going to talk a little bit about the dorsum, which is one of the most challenging things that we do to get it right in restoring the dorsal aesthetic lines. And uh, as Aaron mentioned, please um, email us with questions, and I'll answer all your questions. And then we will also archive this so that for later use, and we'll also consider putting it on YouTube as well. So, of course, read our collection on PRS, which is archived with this presentation. And um, these are my disclosures, you know, they're book disclosures from the, from the books I've published with theme publishers and then instrument royalties from microns. Um, and of course, the resident gateway is a gateway to exclusive content uh, for residents. It's via the hashtag PRS Journal Club um, and then the resident readers collection. Just uh, go to the PRS Residents Gateway. It's, it's a, got an incredible amount of wonderful uh, educational information for residents and actually all plastic surgeons. Some of the stuff on there is phenomenal. So ask questions about it in the comments section and I'll answer them after the lecture. This will be about 15 minutes and uh, we'll rock and roll. So what makes the nasal dorsum look natural? And obviously it's the, uh, the nasal dorsal aesthetic lines. It's those lines that come from the, from the medial brow all the way down to the tip area as you can see here. And they have to be smooth, they have to be refined, and they have to balance the nasal dorsum with the rest of the face. And I think that is the most telltale sign of a well-done or a not well-done rhinoplasty. And it has to be maintained long-term. As you can see on the patient from the, from the, on the left, she has a very thin skin, very um, uh, short nasal bones, but a deviation of the nose. And her dorsum is obviously to be reconstructed uh, to provide for dorsal aesthetic lines and then here she is long term with beautiful dorsal aesthetic lines that end up in the tip on both sides and that's what you want to end up with and you can see she's quite asymmetric her left eye is bigger than her uh, her right eye and the left brow is larger and these are all things that actually have to be pointed out to the patient everybody's face they're sisters not twins as is the nose so you maintain the long-term um, dorsal aesthetic lines that is paramount in in having excellent results consistently in rhinoplasty, and we're going to show you how to do that. So, obviously, underlying the nasal uh, skin is a clinical anatomy. The fusion of the nasal pyramid with the upper lateral cartilages, and, and basically, when you're fusing that and then correcting it, that, that is a very challenging thing at that keystone area, which is very pivotal because that area here is what you have to uh, reconstruct when you're doing a uh, aesthetic dorsal reduction. If you uh, follow history, the way it was done in the past is that they just took it off in a composite manner. 
And that really yielded unsatisfactory results. This is the inverted V deformity, that inverted V that uh, when you when you resect the upper laterals more than, the, than they need to be, you get this inverted V collapse. And that's very classic and seen a lot even to this day, unfortunately. So with the evolution of uh, from composite to component preservation, it's really about what modern rhinoplasty is about. It's about preserving what you what you see rather than taking it in a blind fashion. That's why the open approach to rhinoplasty is so key in not only learning but mastering rhinoplasty. So I'm going to talk to you about the graduated approach to doing upper lateral preservation from sutures to flaps to spreader grafts. And in a high majority of patients, spreader flaps uh, or preservation of sutures is fine, and spreader grafts are not needed in most cases in primary rhinoplasty. This is something that we need to get away from if you follow these tenets uh, for uh, aesthetic dorsal re reconstruction. So these are the dorsal aesthetic lines, and you can preserve a lot of them if you preserve the upper lateral cartilages when you're taking down your dorsum. These are very important components that you need to preserve. And so I call it the four R's. Do you release, resect, rasp, and restore? If you follow these four, comp uh, these key areas for doing a component dorsal reduction, this will serve you well. So let's go through that. And of course, the uh, the cornerstone for getting into the nose is not only the open approach, but it's this um, exposure of the dorsal septal angle. By doing so, you can see that when you're doing this exposure you're going and you're getting down to this blue-white area, which we call the nirvana of rhinoplasty. That is, that is not only the gateway, but it, it is truly the way to get to the septum, harvest septum, and then you're also the first part of separating uh, the mucoperichondral flaps on both sides. So the key is the dorsal septal angle, and you do this bilaterally, and then you, uh, you this allows you then to... Um, get the septum straight and also to separate it from the um, the upper laterals. So once you've done that, then you release the upper laterals from the septum in a very methodical way so that in, you are you are releasing and separating the upper laterals as you can see here. And then you can resect the, the septum incrementally. And this often can be used as a Cayumala strut or ailer contragraphs. So all of this is done with maximal preservation with the reconstitution of the dorsum in mind. Then you rasp the nasal bony dorsum after you've taken down the cartilage and septum. And this can be demonstrated in this, in this uh, short video where basically you're palpating uh, with your index finger on the left, right dorsum uh, to, to ask, ascertain whether it's smooth or not. And if it's not, you'll take a short uh, excursion rasp where you're actually rasping down the dorsum and palpating it, always palpating left, right, midline, dorsal aesthetic lines. This is the key to ascertaining a, an, an aesthetic dorsum, especially in this area. So <clears throat> the most important transition is this, what I call the cornerstone of the keystone area. And you must get this correct. If you destroy it, you must correct it. And this is the hallmark of, of whether a rhinoplasty is done well or you have an inverted V deformity. So you restore the dorsal aesthetic lines. So how do you do that? And you really do it with sutures, flaps, or grafts. And if you follow this algorithm, this will guide you to really obtaining consistently great results. So let's look at sutures only first. If you have less than three millimeter reduction, strong upper lateral cartilages, then, then you can use sutures only. And I call these the upper lateral tension spanning sutures. And they're especially good in weak upper laterals with thin skin. So there's several types. So if you have a one that is strong with, um, with uh, no significant bowing, you don't need to put a lot of tension on that. But if you take down your, your dorsum and they bow down and away, then you'll need to do the tension spanning suture so that pulls it forward. So this is a di an illustration that actually shows that. When you're taking it down, you get a natural bowing. But if they're weak, they bow back further. So you can see this in this patient where we're actually doing, she has weak weakness and she's got bowing of her upper lateral. So you're doing a tension spanning suture through the septum with 5OPDS and you're suturing in place. And this allows you then to reshape and begin to reshape the dorsal aesthetic lines. And then you can place a second suture in this area 
uh, to help reshape that. And that's the, that's these that's what this was done in this patient that had a minimal dorsal reduction, good upper lateral cartilages, and we preserved her upper laterals and dorsal aesthetic lines using suture techniques. And then in thicker skin patients, you can do the same by taking down the dorsum and doing these upper lateral tension spanning sutures because you've preserved this upper lateral cartilage. This is truly um, the, con the continuity between the smooth dorsum, bony dorsum, and the upper laterals. So you can do that in this patient <clears throat> that has, was a primary open rhinoplasty, had upper lateral tension spanning sutures, but she had her upper laterals preserved, taking down only three millimeters of the central component dorsum. And here she is at five years post-op, good dorsal aesthetic lines bilaterally. And here she is at 15 years post-op with continued preservation of upper laterals and dorsal aesthetic lines. That's what you want to see in a patient, not only at short term, but long term at, at 15 years. But what about flaps? When do you use flaps? If you're taking the dorsum down more, then, and if you have strong upper laterals, you can indeed use flaps. So if you have a patient like this that actually has very strong but horizontal upper lateral uh, cartilages and, you, and you're separating them from the septum, these are ideal for flaps so that you can then do the, use the same principles. If they're strong, you can do a horizontal suture. If it's, if it's weak, you can do a spanning suture. And you just uh, curve those inward. So in this patient, the, the, uh, the flaps were used with upper lateral tension spanning sutures. Again, actually to create, uh, here he had a mid-vault collapse and we, we restored it with a dorsal um, upper lateral tension spanning flaps and sutures. And then yeah, this. Sorry, Dr. Roy. <laughs> this is a good time to pause and say, uh, please ask your questions in the comments below. Yeah, and if you have any questions, please uh, ask ask them ask me questions in the comments below, and uh, we will we will respond to them. So now, as we continue with uh, spreader flaps, um, there's again several different types. If just remember, if they're weak and they're bow backward, use a tension spanning suture, which basically means that you're going to pull this forward on the anterior septal angle, and then it'll actually uh, bring it forward and make it smooth. The great thing about upper, um, an open rhinoplasty is you test yourself every time you do this. So here's a patient, upper lateral tension spanning sutures and spreader flaps. So you basically are taking this dorsum down about f five millimeters. So you're doing dual upper lateral tension spanning sutures with spreader flaps. So this allowed you to, to widen the dorsal aesthetic lines, but preserve the upper lateral uh, upper laterals as flaps, turning them in and giving you that smooth dorsum. And this is a beautiful way to do it, and it's also very natural. And, and this was done through the open approach. Now, spreader grafts. You know, we talk a lot about spreader grafts, and I use them every day in secondary rhinoplasty. But in primary rhinoplasty, you must have a reason. If your upper laterals are weak, if you've taken the dorsum down a lot, or if you have short nasal bones, by all means, you must use them because they have either an aesthetic or functional role. Aesthetically, if I can't get the dorsal aesthetic line the way I want it, I'm going to use a spreader graft. And functionally, it does restore the internal nasal valve. But what is perhaps more important is that you preserve the mucosa. And I think that is something that's not mentioned enough. Preserving the mucosa when you're taking down the, the uh, and separating the upper laterals, that is key. So when do I use them in an aesthetic role? If I can't get the dorsal aesthetic line I want, if I have a high dorsal septal deviation, absolutely I'll use it. So this is a patient that actually has both. She has a very high dorsum, very short nasal bones, um, mid-vault collapse, uh, ultra-projecting tip, highly deviation of her nose, ailer rim weakness, I mean a classic case you would see on your oral exam. And uh, this patient obviously needs many things, but for the purposes of tonight, we're going to basically talk about how to make her a smooth dorsal aesthetic line. So we've taken her down via the open approach, seven millimeters. So when you've taken down a dorsum this much with, with short nasal bones, you have to close the open roof with low to low osteotomies. And of course, you have to control um, this dorsum and widen the dorsal aesthetic lines with bilateral spreader grafts. Uh, for two reasons. One is you've straightened the dorsum and, and now you also have to maintain control of it with short nasal bones and a significant dorsal reduction. This is a classic case for doing a spreader graft and this is how she looks postoperatively with a smooth transition from the bony vault to the nasal tip area. 
and in reconstruction of her nasal bones and her dorsum. And, and this is when you use spreader, spreader flaps, which are significant and very powerful. And of course, if you want to enhance nasal length, spreader flaps and spreader grafts are also uh, widely used. And I like to use them uh, in this way, where I'm going to derotate or lengthen a nose in, in a secondary deformity, a foreshortened nose. Uh, I'm going to use extended spreader grafts to derotate the nose and elongate it and make it not only straighter, but also more balanced with the tip and the dorsum, and you're going to reshape the dorsal aesthetic lines. So in conclusion, all of this is guided by your nasal analysis. You want to maintain or restore dorsal aesthetic lines, and you want to use a component dorsal technique. Maximize the use of spreader of sutures and flaps in primary rhinoplasty, but if that isn't enough, then use spreader, spreader grafts by all means. So. Also, I want to invite you all to uh, our upcoming rhinoplasty symposium. It's going to be held in Dallas, Texas, and we'll look forward to seeing you there as well. There's still some room in the cadaver lab section. So with that um, very brief overview, Aaron's going to give me some questions that have come in uh, on this very short session on um, getting it right the first time and using the uh, component dorsum in rhinoplasty. Thank you so much. It's been fun, and we look forward to many more of these with both uh, Drs. Murphy and Hazen coming up. So the first question we have is from Ash Patel off of Facebook. He says, oh. what do you use for the tension-spanning sutures? What do I use for the tension-spanning sutures? Good question. Uh, I use a 5-O-PDS. Uh, I rarely use anything but absorbable sutures, and I use a 5-O-PDS on a PC3 because it's a sharp needle, and and it allows me to get precision with it, and you can you can uh, use it. It's very agile to use. And I, but if I'm going to be using it for spreader flaps, I use that for the tension spanning. For spreader flaps, I'll use 5 Viquel. The next question we have is from Dennis Valente off of Facebook. He asked in advance. He said, "Congratulations! I would like to know what is the role of dermal fillers as hyaluronic acid and calcium hydro." Oh, they're making me say that. Hydroxapatite. Uh, yeah, radius. To, <laughs> to correct nasal dorsal yeah. irregularity. Uh, I, that's a great question. I use fillers a lot. Uh, I use fillers for primary augmentation in patients that don't uh, that want to see what it'll look like without doing dorsal augmentation, especially in some ethnic patients, especially in Asian patients. That is a very uh, significant part of what I do for... Um, in that patient population, but I also use it in secondary problems. If I have a little irregularity, or if I see a patient that has a little irregularity, the most important caveat is stay safe, stay midline, stay deep, and don't over-inject. Keep them in your office for 15 minutes after you inject them, and use a hyaluronic acid filler. Do not use a calcium hydroxyapatite or, or more longer lasting or permanent filler, because anything that's a hyaluronic acid filler will work fine, it'll last a long time, but the other ones, even though they're good fillers, just remember, they're for deep tissue. There is no deep tissue in the nose. It's all subcutaneous, and it goes on to bone. So stay midline, stay safe, and use HAs. We have another question here from Ira Savetsky off of Facebook. He says, choice of cartilage donor site and techniques to minimize warping and migration in dorsal augmentation. Yes. Um, so, of course, that's a little off topic. But when, what do I use for dorsal augmentation? Well, I like to use, in, in, the, in rhinoplasty, I like to use septum, septum, septum as much as possible. I get a straight piece of septum, it stays straight. Usually it's posterior part of the septum when you're harvesting it. If you don't have it, then um, you go to rib. You know, uh, you can go to the fourth or fifth rib. Uh, the last several years, actually, I've been using fresh frozen uh, rib grafts, rib cartilage grafts. Uh, uh, that I'm going to be publishing uh, in the next several months. Um, the key is if you want to shape it, use balanced cross-sectional shaping and carving, but do it so that if it does warp, you're putting it uh, so that the concave edge is coming up, and, and then you fix it to the entire dorsum, proximally and distal, to minimize any warping. Um, I would just caution you that when you're using rib grafts, you need to use an overlay, either with fascia or some type of ADM. I like to use Surgimend um, because it's a thicker porcine type graft, and it lasts it lasts longer, and it, I think it impregnates, or it, it's um, biodegradable, 
and it works well. So, but that's a little bit more of a technique um, oriented, and of course, that's primarily used in uh, in ethnic augmentation or in secondary rhinoplasty. Here's one from Facebook from Ara Salabian. Okay. For those getting started with the component reduction, what are the most common fit pitfalls to avoid with this technique? Well, the common pitfalls are, you know, go slow, go go in a very graduated approach. I know when I do it with my residents and fellows. I take the dorsum down, the component dorsum down, I do it immediately, I take it down four or five millimeters. Go slow, take it in one or two, three more increments, rasp down the dorsum, always palpate. You gotta see if it's smooth. So go slow and do it right. And then preserve the upper laterals. Now, most of the time when you separate the upper laterals from the septum, they wanna get away from you. So they, they uh, retro position. So go slow and make sure you keep palpating. And then the other pitfall is after you've done your osteotomies and close it, always go back and check to make sure your spreader flaps or spreader grafts are still in place. And that is a very important uh, rationale that you must do or you can get some irregularities. Here's one from uh, Patricia Kovarubius. Do you use fascia or any other elements such as alloderm to cover the dorsum sometimes in primary or secondary rhinoplasty? Yes. Yes. Um, I, uh, I I do it not infrequently in, in secondary rhinoplasty. If you have thin skin, uh, I sometimes will use fascia. More frequently, I'll use an ADM, like a surgeon end. Uh, alloderm is fine, but alloderm uh, resorbs, at least in my experience, more so in the dorsum than uh, some of the thicker ADMs. Uh, again, if you have uh, very thin skin and you've had to use an autologous dorsal onlay graft like septum or cartilage, if if you have any palpability, you must fix it. And you can do that with um, with an onlay of fascia or, or autologous dermis, or I prefer an ADM. Here's one from Akash Chandawarkar. What aspects of component reduction are commonly not done properly, requiring further revision? Well, I think the most common thing that's not done properly is to not look at the end um, to make sure after you've done your osteotomies, as I mentioned, that you've not displaced some part of the component dorsum, the flaps or the spreader grafts after you've done your osteotomies and closed your open roof. And I always irrigate out to make sure there's no periosteal segments because if you have a deformity, it's going to be at the keystone area, at the junction of the bony pyramid with the cartilaginous portion of the nose. That is the area you must make sure is smooth. If that's smooth, 95% of the time you're going to have a great dorsum. And I can tell you, the most challenging thing is not getting a great tip today, it's getting a smooth dorsum. And if you follow these four principles, you, it will be transformational for you as you do rhinoplasty going forward. Truly transformational. Here's one from our very own Chad Purnell. He says, hey, how far cephalid should your spreader grafts be inset? Well, I think... Uh, it just depends, Chad. Um, what do you need it for? If you're going to, uh, uh, you know, they should always underlay the nasal bones, you know, for at least two, three millimeters, because it's very important for them to be underneath the keystone area if you're going to use spreader grafts. Um, and so you, you need to observe that. So that's uh, cephalic. And then caudally, um, they just need to go to the distal part of the upper laterals. And then suture them into place. Whether you're doing spreader flaps or spreader grafts, make sure you suture them securely. And the great thing about open rhinoplasty is you just take the skin and pull it over and you can you can make sure you've done it well. If it doesn't look good on the table, it will never look good. So that is an adamant thing. Just remember, I always promise my patients that it, I will make sure that it'll look as great as it can look in the operating room. The rest is up to God and wound healing. But never leave the operating room until the nose looks as straight, as perfect as it can be before you leave. Otherwise, you've got to finish it and do it well. Here's one more from a follower on Facebook named Huda Sheik. Mm -hmm. Should you do the septal harvest before or after the component dorsum and why? Excellent question. You really need to do your septal harvest after you've done your component dorsal reduction. Uh, for several reasons. One is 
uh, because let's just say you had a seven millimeter reduction and you had already taken out your uh, your septum harvest, then all of a sudden you may have a very thin L strut. So always do your dorsal reduction. If you're doing a dorsal reduction, do that first. Harvest your cartilage, then then you can have all the material you need for either spreader flaps, spreader grafts, Cuddy-Muller struts. It's a very important concept. Yeah, always do the component dorsum first, except for the last part, the spreader flaps or, or, or spreader grafts. Obviously, you can't do that uh, if you... Uh, be, uh, but you do your harvest and do it. The, do the harvest from a dorsal approach. It's really an epiphany on, on seeing not only the septum, but also in making the harvest so much easier. Good question. We have a few more here. Sure. Uh, this is from Damien Palafox. Do you use a special splint or approach in order to avoid a potential case of polybeak deformity? Well, I think special. I think the the te here's how you avoid a polybeak. Uh, the classic example is this patient. Um, if you, if I go back, then I'll just show you. If this is a classic example of a, how you can avoid a polybeak, if you have a patient like this that's got a septum-dependent tip, usually the tip is dependent upon the strength and length of your lower lateral cartilage. So if you take down the dorsum here and don't do something to build up the tip, you get a polybeak. This is what this concept made Jack Sheen famous because he then described. Uh, the use of tip grafts to bring up the tip. So the polybeak is a result of over resection of the dorsum and and under correction of tip rejection. So that basically you take the dorsum down and the tip falls over it and you get a polybeak. So uh, the, the key with preventing polybeak is take the dorsum down but you must then drive your attention to bringing the tip up. I know it sounds very complicated, but it is very simple. And again, that you must do, uh, and it must look good because when you're done, you must have a, a smooth super tip with a slight super tip break. Good question. We've got a lot of great questions happening here. This one is from Jesus Baez Marquez. What do you prefer, RASP or Sincel for bony reduction? Okay. And how do you manage bony callus formation when using RASP? Okay. Good question. Uh, I don't like to use the chisel uh, because I think that most cases the chisel will uh, over resect the dorsum. So I use a graduated gradual approach and I'll use a sharp down biting rasp. And, and you know, th they must be sharp. And you do left, right, and they're short excursions. And I think that's important. And the way you prevent callus is that you must irrigate it when you're done. Make sure there's no more periosteal segments because if you don't get that then you can get some irregularities so do everything in rhinoplasty must be done precisely you know that's why you know rhinoplasty is a surgery of millimeters one it's like a cascade effect one part begets the next part so you have to have a cascade of everything going well so that your rhinoplasty can go well so it's like it's like a dominoes. If one part does not go well, then you're setting yourself up for not doing well for the rest of it. But the true cornerstone for getting a great nose is doing the dorsum well. We have two final questions. Sure. This one is from our own uh, resident ambassador, Shuja. He says, what is your recommendation for those residents graduating to become proficient to perform safe and effective rhinoplasty? Oh, that's a short answer. No injury. pressure. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Um, focus, attention to detail. You know, becoming an expert. You know, you got to have the experience, the expertise, and the willpower because rhinoplasty is a very unforgiving operation, and that's why so few people want to do it and want to become an expert. So, you know, learn from every patient. Be very self-critical and. If you do that, that's your lifelong CME. Um, do the best you can, and then go back. To, go back to learn from the experts. Go back to the anatomy lab, and watch videos, and just keep practicing and focusing. You know, the sign of an expert is one who's never ever satisfied with their results. They always see something that the patient doesn't. And I think that once you do that, you'll get to a pinnacle where truly, you know, you know. You know, the, the island sees what the mind knows, and, and really what that means is that once you finally have that epiphany in your in your mind, then you can then say, I can see it and I can fix it. 
Uh, and I, and <clears throat> the other thing is, when I do a rhinoplasty, I know what the nose will look like before I start. Because I have, a, I have an image in my brain of exactly what that nose is going to look like in the end. Often, when I get to the operating room, especially in secondary, there are so many different pathways. But I will always know what the nose looks like. Once you've reached that epiphany, that's truly nirvana in rhinoplasty. It takes a few words and a few years. <laughs> and here's our last question from Jordan Fry. What led you uh, clinically to the development of the component dorsal reduction technique for primary rhinoplasty? Well, Chad, because I had a lot of failures. I probably have destroyed more, more dorsal aesthetic lines until, for, until about 10 years ago or 15 years ago when I, when I developed this technique because the way it was taught in the past was that you would basically do a blind rasping or transect the upper laterals, destroy the mucosa, and just take everything down as a composite dorsum. And that did not make any sense to me and caused a lot of irregularities and mid-wall collapse in my experience. And actually, I saw that actually in presentations that were done by experts that showed quote-unquote good results, but they were not good. If you destroy the dorsal aesthetic lines, that is not a good result in rhinoplasty. I'd rather have a great dorsal aesthetic line and a slight dorsal irregular, a slight dorsal fullness, but doing and having a dorsal aesthetic line that's, that's really in balance really makes for a very nice and more important and natural looking rhinoplasty. So you learn from your mistakes. You, you know where good experience comes from. It comes from bad experiences. So always learn from your mistakes and learn from the things that you do every day. And that'll make you a better plastic surgeon. I learn something every day. Awesome. Well, and I want to thank all of you. These were fantastic questions. I really have enjoyed this. Uh, of course, I always get more out of any lectures, uh, you know, giving it. And, uh, of course, I love rhinoplasty. I love plastic surgery, and it's been a true pleasure to do this first ever PRS uh, Live uh, Grand Rounds on Facebook Live. So hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And please visit us at, you know, facebook.com slash PRS Journal, facebook.com PRS Go, and then, of course, tweet us at uh, PRS Journal. And uh, we'll see you on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. It was fantastic. Enjoy, and again, thanks again to... Sujit, uh, Chad, and, and Jordan for uh, putting this together with Aaron. I know it's been a lot of work. So um, this is coming to you live from Dallas, actually from my home. Now Aaron and I are going to go. No, we're actually uh, going to enjoy the rest of the evening. Enjoy. Thanks so much. And thank you again, Dr. Rorick. Um, let's hear it for Dr. Rorick. <laughs> <laughs> can't, we can't hear anything. Um, right. So we just wanted to thank... Again, we wanted to thank you, Dr. Rorick, and we look forward to the next Grand Rounds with um, Alexis Hazen and one with Bob Murphy coming up soon. Great. Look for the details on prsjournal.com, um, and we will keep everybody posted. So thank you very much, and good night from Dallas. Good night from Dallas. You bet. Take care. Bye-bye.